Hello and welcome to Funk Prog Sweden. We are back and this is the eighth Funk Prog this this year. Uh, however, we're in the ninth month, so we have just missed out one meetup in July because it's summer in Sweden. So over to today's agenda then. Um, me, Magnus Edlasek, I'll do a short intro. Uh, and then uh, we'll s have a functional programming from a theorist perspective by Rhea. Uh, and then for those of you who missed it, now you know it. We had a contest where you could win tickets to the F Sharp Exchange Conference by Skills Matter in October. So we'll announce the winners then. Uh, and then after that, we'll head over to Marcus and his presentation, Changing to Closure Mid-Flight. And in the end, I'll do a summary, uh, schedule and summary uh, of this meetup. First up, I would like to thank our video sponsor, Ada Beat. Ada Beat uh, is a small IT consulting company in Stockholm, where most of the developers have a background in functional programming. If you want to know more about Ada Beat, check them out in social media or on the web at adabeat.com. Also, if you want to support Funkprog Sweden, join the Meetup community. And please follow our YouTube channel, uh, Funkprog Sweden. And uh, check out, also, you can check out the store. We put up like a merchandise store, so you can check it out and you'll find the link in the description. If you have questions during the presentations, please put them in the chat uh, and I will read them out to the presenters. Uh, with that said, let's uh, start. First presenter, Rhea. Welcome to Funk Prog Sweden. Um, without further ado. So basically, this talk will be um, a very general talk on functional programming. Um, it will be more of a top-down approach than a bottom-up. So the difference from my talk to most of my predecessors is that um, most other people have basically worked on actual projects. I haven't, <laughs> but uh, I have the advantage that I've come from academia and I've got a bit of a more theoretical mathematical background, which means I can maybe explain functional programming in more conceptual terms. Don't be scared, I won't show much code in this. I also won't show any maths though. So uh what i aim for is that you really understand the concept behind it at the end of the day and maybe learn some tidbits that you can use um in your daily developer's life for example when you're coding yourself you don't need to be a full-blown functional programmer but if you learn a few things here and there okay i found in my experience that it can really help um so let's get started um this is what I'm going to do in this talk. Um, so basically, uh, from my side, because people like about talking about themselves, but also because you might like to know who I am, uh, how I became somewhat of a functional programmer sometimes. Um, and then what functional programming is from a conceptual point of view and how it is really quite an opposite to object-oriented programming. Then also some advantages, key features, um, different programming languages, and maybe also some limitations. Um, if you find that the uh, whole sequence of chapters, let's say, in this talk is a little bit jumbled, that's on purpose <laughs> because I want to keep you ent engaged and entertained. Um, and it would be stupid for me to go step by step and just you know talk something boring. So sometimes things will be a little bit. Um, changed up okay so about myself um i'm a particle physicist at the moment i'm doing my phd actually in paris and how i got there was uh in high school i just thought you know i loved maths but i thought i might be too dumb to actually be able to study maths so i decided to study physics instead because that seemed like the next best option um I think it was the right decision for the wrong reasons looking back. And regarding what 
I ended up doing, which is a lot of programming actually in computer science. Um, at that point in time, I thought, you know, computer science is for nerds and now I'm not a nerd. Um, <laughs> so I did what not nerds do and studied physics. Um, so I went to Heidelberg, which is in Germany and um, studied physics there, which I enjoyed. I also went to uh, CERN, which is a big particles accelerator in Geneva um and had some nice experiences there um and then i went back to heidelberg to uh, work on my bachelor thesis by that time i realized that i wanted to stay in particle physics which is what this lab CERN is also focused on but i wanted to go to theoretical physics and not the experiments where you build detectors and things like that which was fun but i really wanted to learn what the theory behind it all was um, and so I started working with uh, data and trying to match this experimental data, physics data, to um, physics models, physics theories. Um, at first, that was quite overwhelming, <laughs> but um, I got used to it and I started liking it quite a lot, so much so that I ended up now in Paris uh, working on my PhD and basically still doing the same thing. Um, which is kind of trying to uh, sift through experimental data and understanding it in such a way that where it can make sense and build a physics theory from this. Um, and it was during last year or so that um, I was working a lot on a blog, which I do on the side uh, on Medium, where I write about data science and uh, things like that. Makes sense. And I realized, oh, functional programming exists and it's actually quite cool. And it's right up my street because it works with lots of data and it has some mathematical proofs in it. And me with a strong mathematical background, I was like, yay, that's cool. So I dug into that and wrote an article about that. And um, this article uh, was successful and uh, Magnus contacted me. Um, on Twitter and I took like two months to reply to him because I'm lazy and I don't look on my Twitter, but I eventually did. And so that's how I ended up here. So that's why I'm here today. And what I'm hoping is that you'll like this too. I, I guess you do because you're here today. Um, and I hope that uh, you can also take away some things from this and um, understand functional programming also a little, little more from a conceptual point of view. So um, that being said, all about me, what is functional programming as such? Um, or we could ask, what do functional programmers want? Well, <laughs> at the beginning, actually, what they wanted to do is to write computer programs which were mathematically provable. So it is actually software that is correct anytime. If you've been in software before, um, you probably know that you write a code and it never behaves the way you think it does. And so you test it to death and you test all edge cases you can think of, and then you deploy it. And then something goes wrong again, which you didn't test for. And in functional programming, this can't really happen because as soon as you write this program, you know it's correct. You don't need to test any edge cases, you know it. And that is really the aim of functional programming. That's ambitious. And the question is, how do you manage that? Um, it turns out that there's a very simple trick in a way, uh, which is separating the, sorry, how do they do that? Which is separating the theory, so the data, yeah, the manipulations of data so the function of the data itself in other words transformations of data which is functions i'm separating that from the definition of data and that uh, leads to some very rem remarkable consequences because it enables you to uh, test for your programs better because you know it's correct you just have to test one case and then you know for every other case is right um, you can prove that is correct, you kind of know, but you can also prove it in a mathematical proof. 
in practice this is not done very much because um, these proofs are lengthy and hard to understand but the main the important part is that you know that is true and that you could in principle prove it and because they're so neat basically and true all the time it's much easier to build and scale enormous projects because you don't rack up the type of technical debt that you do when you just build a program with whichever paradigm where um, you add a new feature and then suddenly an old feature um, gets damaged or broken because you added a new feature that, that interferes somehow with old stuff. This doesn't happen in functional programming, which makes it pretty cool. Right. So um, to go on, maybe at this point you think it's kind of academic, uh, which I wouldn't totally disagree with you, but also to point out to you, Microsoft, for example, created F Sharp, which is a pretty functional language. And as uh, Magnus uh, said before, you can learn some more about F Sharp <laughs> if you want to uh, win a ticket today. Um, also, Twitter uses Scala for its backend quite a lot. Scala is a functional, semi functional programming language. So it's sort of half and half uh, functional and other paradigms, but really it, it aims to make functional programming easy. So that's a cool thing. WhatsApp was written in Erlang, which is one of the most hardcore functional programming languages there are. Um, and lots of it still is written in Erlang, especially the server side stuff. Um, then Facebook uses Has Haskell, which is also one of the most hardcore functional programming languages to fight spam and malware. And they really swear by it. So, you know, I wouldn't mess with Facebook programmers regarding whether Haskell is great or not. <laughs> they think it's great. And um, actually, going way back in history, Google was the search machine. Google was only possible, really, because of MapReduce. And MapReduce is a key algorithm in which originated from functional programming. We'll come back to that one a little later on. And there are many, many, many more smaller project, projects and companies that are almost centered around functional programming, like Autobeat, but also like many, many others. So uh, that being said, um, I've talked about functional programming maybe in a way that is that almost highlights it as <laughs> super amazing and super enormous, which it isn't. So I have here a, a chart from Stack Overflow Trends, um, which shows you the difference of um, the object-oriented programming in blue, OOP, which, um, so basically the, the amount of questions, the percentage of questions that were asked, which had that tag versus functional programming. You can see pretty easily that um, functional programming is not even half probably a third or so of um, what object-oriented gets. Now, there are more paradigms in programming than just object-oriented and functional, but object-oriented is like the leading one. So I'm picking up that. And it gets even more drastic when I put in the languages. So here I've just randomly kind of picked a few languages. Java is very object-oriented. You can do some functional on other types of programming with it, but it's very object oriented. And as you can see, it's um, pretty huge, around 6% of all uh, questions these days. And in comparison, I've listed two major uh, functional languages here. <laughs> They're just tiny, There's almost nothing in comparison. So Functional programming, despite all its virtues and despite all its uh, successes, is really still a niche thing. Um, but it's gaining traction and it's getting more and more important. And actually, those people who can do pro uh, functional programming are, are, so far, I know, very sought after in the market at the moment. Um, now, to compare functional programming to object oriented programming, uh, what we can see is that with object-oriented programming, that's what everybody learns at school. Everybody who does computer science, that is. Um, 
And what you kind of learn is that objects are the basis of all software. So picture a class which uh, contains students and um, those students have attributes like marks, for example, grades. And then we have a function in that whole class, that object, which, for example, can calculate a, um, an average grade of that class. And so this is an object, this is a cornerstone of this software. And then you can manipulate different objects. You can have many classes that, um, or many groups of students say that um, make a year and this a group of years make a school and a group of schools make, I don't know what. And you can do lots of fun things with that. So it's kind of very modeled after the real world. And they contain, and this is crucial, they contain the data, like students and grades and things, and functions like calculating averages. And so the fo focus of this whole thing is not anymore on what am I solving or what am I working on? Because you've already defined yeah, that, you've already defined your students and how they work and their grades and what they are. Um, now you're focusing on how to manipulate this and how to make these objects interact. We all know this, I think. <laughs> On the other hand, we've got functions that are, in functional programming, the basis of all software. So with this school and student example, we would have uh, calculating an average would be a basis uh, element. And then we'd have other functions like, I don't know, um, building a timetable <laughs> or um, calculating the risk of an accident at a sports lesson or whichever, you, you name it, uh, functions are the basis of all that. Um, they are pure. I'll come to that later, what that means. They are deterministic. Deterministic means that they always give the same output, no matter which, uh, I mean, if you put the same input in twice, they'll give the same output, no matter what. So like a random number generator isn't functional because it's not deterministic. And they're immutable. So um, that is like the type of a function for its example of it returns a float. It will always return a float. It cannot return a string. And any type of data is immutable too. Like it's immutable in terms of its type and it's immutable in terms of what it is. So for example, the grades of students if I want to modify one grade because I put it in the wrong way, then I have to recreate that whole data set and put it into a new um, piece of the memory. That can sound cumbersome, but it comes with its advantages too. And now the focus is on what, what do I solve? So we have the how-to, that's the functions. And now the question is, okay, um, I've got a bunch of functions, which data do I uh, apply that on? So in terms of the school, like which students are coming in this year? <laughs> that kind of thing. So that's basically the difference between object oriented and functional, which is kind of like they're almost opposite in a way, but you can make them work together as well. And key advantages of functional programming is that First of all, it's, everything is local. So you don't have data uh, floating around somewhere in your code. And then you've got a student named Max uh, somewhere in your code, which you defined later because he came into the year later or something like that. And then you have to find in your code base, ah, oh, shit, where did I, sorry, nasty word. Um, where did I put Max? Uh, now I can't find him anymore. And where is well, his grades? Um, no, in functional programming, everything is neatly separated. And so uh, Max is together with the other students in a neat spreadsheet somewhere, and then the functions are somewhere else. And sure, you can do that with object-oriented in principle, but um, it's not automatic. And in functional, it is by default like that. Um, it's timely. So for example, if I um, put a wrong, gave a, a student the wrong grade at some point, and now I corrected it, I, can, I know that I corrected it and kind of win. Um, 
when in, in terms of the sequence of the actions I took, because I've kept copying that data and keeping uh, stock of the versions of data because they're immutable. And so this way I'm sort of in a safer space because I don't manipulate my data at random and then at the end notice that there's a bug days after I've run this program and now I'm thinking, oh, where was that? And do I have to rerun the whole thing again and to find the bug? <laughs> um, with functional, that's a lot easier. And finally, I mean, it's more structured because everything's kind of neat, you know? It's, everything is tidy. And so I think this tidiness is a key element of functional programming. So to go further into detail about what I mean by this tidiness, um, I could start with the Lambda calculus. I decided not to go into detail of it because it's maths. <laughs> and I'm not sure that everybody here uh, likes it. But um, basically, what Lambda calculus states is a theory of what you can actually compute, what can, you can actually um, put in a software program and what you can't, because you can't prove it. Um, and the neat thing about this is it's the basis, first of all, of all functional programming, but it can be used to simulate any Turing machine. And um, just to drop some names, uh, it was invented by Alonzo Church, which was who was the teacher of Alan Turing. So cool names in here. Functional programming, as I said, is based on this, but obviously you don't need to know all of this in order to be a good functional programmer. But it's cool to know that this is behind all of this. And I think, you know, basically you can say maths is tidy. So this kind of uh, programming is kind of tidy sometimes, hopefully, mostly. <laughs> Another key feature is side effects. And this is uh, something that I talked about a little earlier. So consider this function square. <laughs> it returns the square of a, presumably a number. It's just some Python code. It's a very short and kind of dumb function that has no side effects. Now consider this function. Uh, this is a function that appends uh, something, an element to a list. And this has a side effect because I have a list here which I have predefined. And so what happens is I cannot take this function append to list and like copy it and paste it into another um, piece of my software, for example, because it won't work. Because that global list isn't defined in that other piece of the function uh, of the software. And what functional programming does it, it is it eliminates all side effects. So in this example, uh, we could put this list as an argument as well. And this is in principle what you do. If you have a side effect, you just add it as an argument uh, to this function. This way, of course, it's a bit annoying if you're using the same list all the time, but you can solve that as well through a higher order function. So I'll come to that in a minute. So to sum up, functions are pure. That means they've got no side effects. Um, they are first class, and that's just another fancy word of saying um, they're the building blocks of a program. In object-oriented programming, objects are first class. And um, sometimes functions can be of higher order. So, I mean, they always can, but uh, they not always are. Higher order functions, that means that a function can take another function as an argument, or it can return a function as a result. And so in this example earlier here, where you had um, appending to a list, say you're always appending to the same list, what you can do is you can um, define another function that takes the old function with an argument, uh, which is the, this list that you're presumably using the whole time. And so this way you've killed a uh, side effect, you've used, uh, you've used a higher order function uh, to make this program short, nevertheless. Right, and one last uh, key feature is, which is pretty cool, is the map reduce thing I talked about earlier. So consider the following example. It's 
Um, not a very elaborate example. Basically, you have a list of integers, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and what you're trying to do is you're taking only the odd integers, you're squaring them, and then you're adding all the squares. So you are doing one squared plus three squared plus five squared in this example. And what a, an entry level software developer, let's say, would do, probably do is something like I've shown here. So they're writing loops, um, which is cool. But when this list of integers, for example, gets very large, this gets very slow. <laughs> And so a more efficient way of doing it is using map and filter and reduce. As you can see here, um, it's all Python. And so you can use the filter function of Python to um, take out just the odd integers and then uh, square it with a map, mapping the odd integers to their squares and finally reducing, which is a fancy way of saying, um, adding up in this case, but it can be, just basically making a summary of whatever you're doing. And this in fact is um, something what like Google did um, back in the days. So what, and which they're just still doing with their search machine to be fair. Um, so basically their list is all web pages on the web. Um, and what they're doing is they're filtering them when you put in a query, then they will filter this whole enormous, vastly, impossibly large list um, by your query. Possibly do something else with it because some, um, com some pieces of queries may be more relevant than others. And Google knows this, so it learns kind of, okay, what, what's important and what isn't. So it might map some thing or another thing and finally reduce so it'll show you a summary usually of the best search results and the reduction lies in rating these results and then finally displaying them to you that's basically what google does and it was only possible because of the map and reduce um, algorithm it wouldn't have been possible with a for loop because it wouldn't have, would have taken ages to scrape them, scrape all these lists every time so basically, Google wouldn't exist without functional programming, which is kind of neat to know. Um, and finally, uh, I mentioned there are no for loops. There are definitely no for loops and no while loops in functional programming. If you do want to loop, then you use recursions. And recursions means that you have functions which call themselves. So for example, here I have the Fibonacci sequence which would be um, return. And you can see here that uh, in the else statement, if I enter a number n which is larger than one, then um, the function calls itself. And that's how it would loop around. If I say Fibonacci of 100, then you'll have to calculate for a while, but um, it's still more efficient than uh, calculating it with a loop in most cases. The downside of this is that it uses a lot of memory. So you have to be careful with that. Okay, so now we'll get to um, the languages. I've just given you a brief overview here um, on the most boring slides ever um, on which languages are good for functional programming and which are not. Um, I'll just go through them very quickly. So on this slide, you have languages which are not that great for functional programming. This includes Perl, which in fact is built on not being functional. So it makes side effects a key feature because um, it started off as a text manipulation language. And when you're manipulating text, you really want to know, oh yeah, this thing that I did earlier right there, um, maybe change that around a little bit differently, that kind of query, um, which is always very local and um, not functional at all. So you don't want to use Perl as a functional programming language. You could use Go. Go is better in principle for other programming um, paradigms, but it's 
pretty straightforward to implement. I haven't done functional programming in Go myself, but apparently it works. <laughs> um, in Java, it's, it's okay, but it's not very readable. So stay away from it. Swift, um, you could do it, but um, according to my research, I mean, I didn't find anything about functional programming. Like that's really just like one or two very small projects and that's it. So if you do it, you'll be pretty alone. And in C, if you're one of those guys, uh, so in C Sharp and C++, you can in principle do some functional programming, but it will be impure, just based on how the language is built. And don't try to use Objective-C for this. Um, Objective-C is procedural in principle, I believe. Um, and so it just won't work. Uh, next up, we have JavaScript. Well, funnily enough, um, functional programming is, is quite possible. And in fact, if you use, for example, immutable data types, so that means you just um, specify the type and don't change it, like a float or an integer, um, that actually is good for like things like Angular and React. It gives them a performance boost, so that's great. Um, PHP is also cool. not that bad but you won't really do pure functional programming with it. Um, Ruby is also not that bad. Scala is a notable one. Um, Scala is mostly functional and only object oriented if it's super complicated in functional programming. Um, I'll come to that in a minute, what would be super complicated, but there are a few things and Scala then just go, grabs the object oriented um, option. Uh, Python is an interesting one. It didn't start out, out functional at all, but I use Python quite a lot. And so what I'm seeing is that in each update that I, Python uh, brings, it gets more and more um, functional things, uh, functional features, plus more and more packages are built in a functional style, let's say. So I find it pretty intuitive to at least do some impure functional programming in Python myself, which I do. Um, and now we have basically the rock stars of functional programming. So there's Clojure, which we'll hear about later on. Um, according to its creators, it's about 80% functional. So that's probably similar to Scala. Um, it's possible to do less functional programming though in Clojure if you want to. Um, Rust is an awesome language, which I personally adore. Um, is, it isn't fully functional, but um, some of its key concepts are built um, directly on functional programming. And so it's, it's useful to know some functional programming when you're starting out with Rust. And then we have Erlang and Haskell, which are both like some of the most um, pure functional languages that there are. Um, I wouldn't recommend either of them for beginners but uh if you if you're knee deep in the matter then don't hesitate to to give them a try i personally haven't though so what are the limitations and we're almost nearing the end of this talk um the limitations of functional programming but maybe also the beauty of the, that in itself so one thing is that it's pretty difficult to um, have user generated input or some random output with functional programming because um, things are immutable, right? So if you have immutable, uh, if you have a user input, that could be anything that's mutable by definition. And if you have some randomly number generator, for example, which outputs a random number, that's also not functional. It's it could be something different anytime. It's not deterministic, so um, that won't work. There are, depending on the language, there are workarounds for these kind of things. Um, but I found them to be extremely complicated. So in my opinion, if you're being pragmatic, it might be better to um, just go object oriented or imperative or um, procedural um, when you do need that kind of stuff. Um, recursions, as I mentioned before, uh, recursions can be quite heavy on the memory. So that can be a little bit uh, 
uncomfortable if you're having a small computer. Um, again, there are workarounds for this kind of thing. And uh, what I recommend is search for your specific problem. Usually there are some solutions on Stack Overflow or wherever you go. Um, it's hard to give a general advice on those kind of problems, though, in my opinion. Um, and then next up, it's not really beginner friendly. And I touched about that earlier. I mean, it's got strong mathematical foundations, which can be intimidating, which is why I left it out. Um, and even if you're not doing any maths, the learning curve is pretty steep because it's just not at all what we're learning in school. However, the payoff is large, um, both on an intellectual level, I find, but also like if you're just searching for a job <laughs> because um, functional programming is on the rise and we're seeing that the people who do functional programming are also better paid on average. That's a fact. Uh, you can look that up. Uh, for example, on the Stack Overflow, has some nice statistics on that other sites too. Um, and it's got a smaller community because it's small. Um, but I wouldn't say that that's a total drawback because you can probably see here at this conference, you just meet a lot of really nice people on the way. And when you have a community which is as crowded as, say, the Python community, for example, which is an amazing community, you don't meet that many people like as people. You meet them as, <laughs> I don't know, I've got a problem with my code. Can you please solve it kind of thing? And so I find it quite nice to have a more intimate atmosphere sometimes, which is what functional programming at this moment in time is still pretty much um, useful for. So final words. Um, in my opinion, and my opinion only, but I think it's not only my opinion, um, functional programming is extremely useful for large projects um, because it's clean because you can put these functions into place wherever you go and you know exactly what the function is inputting and what it's outputting. So you can just stack them together like, like Lego stones and build Lego houses. <laughs> um, and this is especially practical if you're doing parallel programming because um, sometimes with object-oriented programming and things like that, you can um, get speed issues when uh, there are codependencies on different nodes. Uh, so that's the thing to watch out for, but not in functional. When you've got large data sets, unless you're doing a lot of manipulation and a lot of copy pasting when you're using a lot of memory, you don't want that. Um, or when you need ex extensive testing, because in functional programming, um, testing is it's not trivial, but it's, it's as easy as it gets. Um, also, I would say, you know, even though it's just a steep learning curve, it's not necessary to learn from the books, like nothing in programming, really. I mean, street smart beats book smart a hundred times if you ask me. Uh, you can have a fancy degree, but that doesn't mean that you can actually uh, code a cool project or write the software of a Tesla, for example. Um, and functional programming is gaining traction. So we are seeing more and more mainstream languages. My eyes on Python because I use it a lot, but there's others too. Um, that are including more and more features, which remind me strongly of uh, functional programming, which is very encouraging. And also the uh, communities of, for example, Rust, but also Haskell are uh, growing. And you could probably see on this conference right here as well. So we have a growing, passionate community around a growing and passionate um, phenomenon in software. So that's it for me. Um, I guess you like functional programming. Uh, if you have it, then I hope you like it after this. So thank you for that. Thank you, Ria. <clears throat> thank you very much for your presentation. Really, You're welcome. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I have some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, what language did you start to work with? I mean, where did you learn to <clears throat> program? That's a, a very interesting question, actually. Um, I'm not exactly sure myself what I started with. Uh, I started coding sometime age 15 or something, uh, just online browser-based. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, 
And then what I really started out with was Bash and C++. Did you and learn now it yourself I or? Oh, sorry, did you learn it by, this, by yourself or did you have a class or? Um, I didn't have a class. Um, I learned it pretty much hands-on while doing science. <laughs> so I was working on my bachelor thesis at the time and my first research paper. And I had to manipulate large amounts of data, which would have never, ever fit in 100 Excel sheets. Um, so I had to ask some graduate students how they did it. And that's how I learned it, essentially. <laughs> Very hands-on. Cool. Um, so then you started out with imperative programming in the beginning. Right. Was it hard then to go in from like, how do I do a loop to recursion? Or what was what was the like the biggest hurdle from going, from your perspective, going from imperative to a more functional style of programming? So I would say it was probably um, from my last, from a research project before last. Actually, I was. Uh, this will sound extremely technical, um, but I was working on trying to find out how uh, precisely we know the data of um, particular collisions um, inside the uh, particle collider. Um, and I was working on, there, there were different sources of uncertainty on different types of data. And some of them were correlated and others weren't. And I was writing a software which would automate, which would recognize which errors were correlated and then calculate a, a total uncertainty. Um, regarding those um, different error sources. So it was kind of a combination of physics knowledge, technical knowledge, and programming knowledge that got me there at the end. And I think these days I work a lot with the machine learning algorithms actually and things like that, but um, which is, which of course sounds amazing on paper and it is, mm -hmm. but um, actually I think my personal greatest achievement was actually this uncertainty thing, which didn't involve machine learning at all. Cool. Uh, final question. I mean, when you started working with functional programming, did it elevate your, like, how you thought about problem solving or how you attacked different problems? It did. Um, so for once I found that I had a very similar trajectory now in programming as I had with physics. I started out as an experimental physicist and then moved to theory. And I'm kind of doing the same with programming. I started out super hands-on and now I'm learning more and more about the, the theories behind it. That and I think um, learning functional programming I haven't, I mean, I've written some code, which is purely functional, but in my bigger projects, it ha I've basically had improvements by using some snippets, if you want, of functional programming. They're canceling some side effects and um, adding some uh, immutability here and there. And that has actually spe sped up my programs by, I would say, more than 30%. Cool. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for to your you presence. for having me. Yes, you're warm welcome. It was really nice to have you. Uh, then we'll go over to the next topic on the agenda. Uh, the, we will now announce the happy winners to the tickets of the F Exchange Skills Matter in October. So, first winner is ta -da! Oh, Kiko. Congratulations, Kiko. We'll keep it. We'll yeah. I'll come to that. Uh, Second winner is Daniel. Congratulations, Daniel. Third winner, David. And fourth winner is Dave. So we'll contact the winners uh, on whichever medium you shared and, uh, and participated in the contest. We will contact you s and uh, send over the information that you need and the people at the F Exchange need to get the tickets over to you. And again, thank you very much to Skills Matter and uh, the conference F Exchange by offering us free tickets and handing them out to all the participants here at the Funkprog Sweden. Uh, and as Rhea said, I mean, we're a small but growing community, hence we're doing this. Uh, so really, thank you everyone for joining in today. 
And thanks for all the messaging in the chat also. With that said, I will hand over to the next guy, Changing to Closure Mid-Flight by Marcus. Hello and welcome, Marcus, to Funk Prog Sweden. Hey, thank you. Good You're to welcome. be here. Super excited. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Warm welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I hand Can it over to you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, great presentation from Ria. Thank you so much. And um, I guess I'm uh, I'm at the mid. I'm calling in from Houston, so I'm at the middle of at the peak of my morning coffee experience. I don't think I, I can literally not stop talking. So if this is too long, just wave your hands or something. And um, let's see if I can switch. There we go. Yeah. So I um, I discovered programming when I was about ten. Um, some basic, some Pascal, some C. I don't know if there's any old timers in the um, watching this, but there was an old video mode called mode 13 back in the day where you could get 320 times 200 pixels worth of graphic data on the screen in a linear buffer. And that was my youth probably like drawing nice demographics programs and stuff like that. Uh, I sold my first piece of software when I was 15, a uh, content management system in Java. Uh, I didn't realize that I should probably have, you know, made a company out of that back in the day when the web wasn't very dynamic. Uh, had some sort of software development career in Stockholm. Um, and I co-founded a company called Artilect around 2010. And I left there for an extended sabbatical around 2012. And then in 14, I co-founded a new uh, startup with a, a doctor here in the Houston area called uh, Sarma, Dr. Bradamori. And uh, our, our job is to fight death with process improvement. So we're in the, our first mission is to make sure people don't die of sepsis in hospitals. And um, I'm super excited about that because I think uh, usually as a developer, I'm trying to look for, for things that, that uh, I can make a living out of, but also has a meaning because I think there's a lot of meaninglessness in, in the software space and IT space. So I'm, I'm super grateful that I'm, I got to be a part of this journey. Um, Somewhere along the road, I started getting severe JavaScript fatigue. There was a bunch of reasons why we ended up on the JavaScript stack, um, primarily because we needed to be a, hy a hybrid app at the time. And um, gradually, I was sinking into the famous tar pit, and uh, things got slower and, and more, more cumbersome to work with. And so we switched to Clojure uh, after having done some research. And two years ago, basically from a blank slate or, or um, Vanilla and um, and still it was a massive success. So if there's anything uh, I want to give you today, uh, it's the it's just the idea that we switched from a painful situation uh, to closure, and we're super happy about it despite having done a lot of mistakes along the way. And I hope to be able to communicate some of what was helpful for us, uh, uh, and we'll see about that along the way yeah so we switched relatively unprepared um, under difficult circumstances because basically when we were about to roll out our first big rewrite in closure script uh, the covid shutdown started happening over here and um, um, we decided to pivot and try to use our technology to help screen for for covid and help keep some workplaces open and that basically started a very very intense year of of uh, trying to keep up with the pandemic from a software side and delivering solutions um, to people basically asking from the streets for it. And um, so, so uh, if we could do it uh, during these circumstances, I think uh, anyone can do it under, under better circumstances. Let's see, there we go. Th yeah, so the background here that we came into this with was we had a hybrid app uh, based on the Cordova platform, so uh, we could build native apps with JavaScript. This was uh, and um, this was the Angular One era, just before React took over. Um, anyone seeing Angular One and not getting PTSD is not probably a healthy uh, person. But uh, for a short while, it seemed like that was the bee's knees, and and um, then we quickly realized it wasn't. Um, it was a Node backend and uh gradually i was getting more made more javascript fatigue as i realized that the language it's, itself was changing every other month and the massive amount of libraries coming out and and just keeping up with everything i think in the end it just wasn't very fun and um 
I had to learn how to navigate the JavaScript sort of uh, um, problems, if you will. Uh, I sort of came into this from a sabbatical. I wasn't super warmed up and had to figure out how to navigate around uh, all the intricacies of JavaScript. And I think I came up with a very functional oriented approach and, and basically just passing a bunch of maps around, which is the leading theme in, in the closure community. Like the, the main abstraction is to pass a bunch of maps around. Um, but also the difficulty of, of applying a, a functional programming discipline while building a team, because it's possible to do functional programming in JavaScript, like Ria pointed out in the previous talk, uh, but it's a discipline and, and it requires a takes a bunch of effort and energy and reviews and, and uh, education in order to do it uh, in a scaling way. So why would you consider switching? Why would we consider switching? Um, the, the way I see it is that software development is annoyingly hard. And, um, and I started looking for things to make it easier and better. Um, and there was a bunch of things pointing to closure at the same time. Uh, the beating the averages Graham article that many are referring to uh, definitely was high impact for me. Um, also a bunch of testimonies about a small group of people accomplishing great things. And you'll see if you start researching this, you'll see a bunch of FUD too, seeing that, you know, closure is not super popular. It should have taken off by now, yada, yada, yada. But every now and then I would see these testimonies that would say something completely different. And being a small team and having a lot of work to do ahead of us. Like we have a lot of products that we want to build. I started, I started, started realizing that things could be done differently, and and I, I wanted to try to build a team that was, that was doing something special, and where we had high leverage on every developer, and and um, I think I was very proud of our work, our first product and our launches uh, back then. We had some five hospitals, I think, and uh, and we've written a massive amount of code in very short time. Uh, but I wasn't very proud of the code base. It was more like, hey, you know, I, could, I got this Frankenstein's monster walking and, you know, uh, has stilts and stuff and, and it doesn't fall at all. And I'm like, that's not a very proud, like, um, I, I wasn't very proud about it. I was proud about the product and what it accomplished, but I wasn't proud about the code base. Uh, or I could be, but I, it required some background and explanation, you know, hey, and I have a rule in the company which says you can't judge another person's code until you know the situation it was written in. And from that standpoint, the code was great. It was awesome because it was written under a lot of pressure, but objectively in some degree of objectivity, it wasn't um, something I was super proud of. Okay, moving on. Yeah, so one of those testimonies is from a guy on Netflix. You've probably seen this if you watched a bunch of closure talks, but I'm just gonna read it out. A lot of the best programmers and the most productive programmers I know are writing everything in closure and swearing by it, and then just producing ridiculously sophisticated things in a very short time. And that program productivity matters. And I 100% agree. And I think this was one of the most inspiring quotes for me to hold on to while I contemplated switching. That's a rather remarkable statement, um, I would say. Yeah, and it wouldn't be a closure talk if we didn't quote uh, a dictionary of some sort. And everyone knows that the only real dictionary on the internet is the hacker jargon file. Uh, so the right thing, capital R, capital T, that which is compellingly correct, compellingly the correct or appropriate thing to use, do, say, etc. Often capitalized, always emphasized in speech as though capitalized. Many of uh, use of this term often implies that there is a fact that that in fact, reasonable people may disagree. What is the right thing for a Lisp to do when it sees mod A zero, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. Uh, and I started to see that switching to closure was the right thing. And uh, um, that means, you know, um, roll up your sleeves and get to work when you see a right thing out there that hasn't been followed. Yeah, so the issues with JavaScript and the situation we were in, uh, you all know as functional, interested programmers is, you know, state would be the, the main thing. Angular one is notorious for doing bi-directional state, which it becomes ridiculously complicated pretty much at once. Um, it's a very humbling experience to think that you're smart enough to handle it, you know, and, um, but also the normal stuff, you know, uh, impurity and that the, the applying functional programming would, would be a, would like save us, but it's also had to be applied as a discipline. And the main thing I've highlighted here is the JavaScript fatigue. 
I have to testify, guys, I'm seven years, eight years soon. I'm in my eighth year of this startup. I, I don't remember when I learned something new and I have absolutely zero fatigue and I'm more excited about development than I've ever been. That was not the case two years ago. Um, and um, also growing a team, uh, the, there was an unexpected cost of opinions and an unexpected cost of decisions trying to be like sort of graduate from being the solo developer to a lead developer to a, to a team lead or a manager um, was was very very hard because you have to sort of do do your day job as a, as a, as a developer and keep the service alive and all of that while like building a team around that and all of a sudden I realized that that opinions cost a lot and they're super uh, expensive to enforce and um, in the end I think the main issue was it wasn't fun anymore uh, development in general and um I, I think you all have heard this story before grumpy old developers um turning to closure um and closure has answers to this uh, immutability concurrency uh, conciseness um even stability like language stability uh, I've, I've got some negative feedback from from a disgruntled employee that was not happy about the switch saying that uh, thank you i've got some coffee coming in here thank you Aaron. Uh, saying that um, that that the language has stagnated, just look at the language updates, and I'm like, that's the point. You know, it doesn't move all the time. It doesn't change every other month. You know, um, uh, it's all good. We talked it out, but and I think that's that's in part because it's a mature language in a very 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 nice standard library, but also that it has macros. So the language, the evolvement of the language is built into the language. Uh, it's extremely minimalistic. It has a lot of opinions and it's super fun. Um, I'm just going to put it that bluntly. Um, yeah, so too long didn't read or whatever that means. Um, every step of the way, every switch we made or everything we rolled out, every milestone was a massive success from day one. And the thing that we kept saying was we should have done it sooner. The first web app rewrite was like a, a just day and night difference uh, in, in the quality of the code. Um, and the first uh, start of using closure script instead of uh, just plain old JavaScript for node on the back end was also a massive success from day, day one, although like closure script and node um, with a like sort of pr heavy promise based JavaScript landscape can be a little bit awkward or you get less bang of, for the buck from closure script. It was still a massive success. The first time uh, we made the project in, in Closure proper on the JVM, this was uh, actually uh, started by two guys who came from the JavaScript Closure Script side, and they've never used the JVM before. So when I say Closure proper, I mean Closure on the JVM as opposed to JavaScript uh, Closure Script on, on Node or in the front end. And uh, and the guy calls me like at 10 p.m. at night, and he's like, absolutely blown away. He's like, yeah, I've done Closure Script for many years. I didn't get the whole thing about the REPL driven development. And, and he's like, I can't believe we ever did anything different than this. And like, it somehow produces joy and happiness. And I think I have some clues about why that is, but. Um, and then, then uh, the milestone of, of getting a, a full sort of proper back and going enclosure was also a success from day one. Um, yeah. So, uh, JavaScript as an entry point to Closure and ClosureScript, I think, should be highlighted a little bit because I think a lot of people are stuck in the JavaScript jungle or, or um, a tar pit, if you will. The tar pit refers to a, a paper written on how to do software better out of the tar pit. Uh, thank you, Jeb, for giving me the paper. Um, read it and, and get wiser. But um, yeah, so JavaScript as an entry point. Uh, I think could be highlighted a little bit because I think many people are stuck there. So Angular React, what's the next thing there? Angular Re Redux, what's the next thing there? I started thinking about uh, what that should be. And I saw React Redux as, as something that was way better than Angular, but clearly like not finished in some sense. And it seemed like an approach, but wasn't really wrapped up. And I started looking around. And that's when I found ClosureScript actually. Um, and like you have to use Redux or Immutable JavaScript, uh, Immutable JS, uh, because there's no standard library to handle all of that. And then the realization that Clojure actually has a standard library. That's how hostage everyone is, is by the JavaScript scene. Like we're all getting used to not having a standard library. 
and that's almost no exaggeration. Um, like the amount of dependencies we have in our projects now is is very very small. And I used to see these like long lists of you know warnings of dependencies and security issues with some obscure JavaScript library uh, because everything became an, an npm package because there's no standard library. Uh, another sort of um, important point along the way for me was uh, learning about reframe or reading about it. Uh, reframe is a, a front end, I guess, library or approach for ClojureScript um, that has the that that sort of has an, a, uh, an approach that is similar to Redux but a couple of orders of magnitude higher or a couple of abstractions higher up, if you will. Um, I think it made me smarter just reading about it and, and pondering why it was the way it was. And the one thing it does that was new for me was separating the name of an event from the event handler, from the name of an effect, from the effect handler. So one thing that used to be one thing is now like four or five things. And and all of a sudden things get very, very simple. And I think closure, closure script is way ahead of the game when it comes to um, uh, figuring out those abstractions. And I think it's because of the, the, the functional sort of underlying paradigm uh, and in trying to make things pure. Uh, yeah, if you haven't noticed yet, my approach to this is a little bit shotgunny, like it's all over the place because I'm, 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 my idea is to give out breadcrumbs, you know, of things that people can maybe pick up on and, and be inspired by or run away from if, you, if you're in that inclination. Yeah, so so uh, same language front end and back end. It was very very attractive when we started out with JavaScript. It's still true on Closure Script with Closure Script and Closure uh, to not have to context switch and not have to learn multiple paradigms. Um, and I think still think the Closure Script on Node as as an introduction is a is a very good entry point because you don't you don't have to change any of your stack or your deployment options. And maybe a first attempt at switching, if, if you feel inclined to that, is re rewriting just a single module of, of um, node code tree and the closure script. I wish I did that, and I wish I did it way sooner because it's easier than, than replacing the whole stack and all the you know, CI pipelines and stuff like that. Um, and this idea of like Node.js being asynchronous, uh, no one uses the asynchronicity and everyone just you know, waits, waits and, and tries to get away from it. So they're sort of almost working against the paradigm itself. And those by using promises and, and that sort of uh, syntax uh, notation of, uh, or hack, I would say, with the async await. And um, the, the whole like Node.js is, it's surprisingly hard to work with once you start to look around a little bit, and and promises work great, but but it's also awkward compared to, um, just going going uh, bottoms up as traditionally. I don't know if that point was well made, but there's something there to explore. Um, still worth it was my point, I guess, even if you have to do awkward promise based development in Closure Script. Um, moving on. Yeah, our first production code was a backend worker service in ClojureScript. Um, uh, it was great, a great success, and we only did it because we haven't that team hadn't discovered Closure Proper yet. Um, but it's possible to do this. Man, I got a lot of slides on Closure for the backend. Uh, I'm just going to move on, actually. Uh, yeah, so one thing that that uh, I I really wish we switched to Closure Proper sooner. And one thing that that delayed that was we were under such heavy pressure um, product wise, we needed to develop features and the people asking about it, big cities in the US, and we didn't have time to stop and breathe and reconsider our infrastructure and deployment options. So at that point, we had a node backend and uh, we deployed it in one of those magical, you know, run your node code here, uh, cloud machine type thingy and uh, it supposedly should scale infinitely and do all kinds of magical things and then you press the wrong button and everything you know uh, breaks as normal and and um, um i don't know if this makes sense to anyone but uh, that made the whole switching scenario way harder um, and i think looking back I should have added an external team to help us switch with the infrastructure. Uh, we ended up moving away from the magical cloud machine thingy to, to just virtual machines and uh, putting a, a reverse proxy in front of or behind the load balancer and, and basically 
putting up a, um, a closure backend in parallel with the node backend and implemented basically what they would call a modern cloud architecture for the strangler pattern or just like gradually moving functionality over from one to the other. The old node backend is still alive and uh, I, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's very, very like legacy heavy. Um, and um, I think we had a very, uh, we had an experienced closure team. We got some help from Cognitech at that point, the creators of closure. And we had some very, very experienced closure guys that um, we, I think we underutilized because we hadn't switched to closure proper yet. And they, um, and it, what happened instead, because they were uncomfortable with Node, was that we put a lot of functionality into Postgres and the database instead. So we had these uh, massively complicated uh, database things going on, uh, just because we were trying to not be adding more complexity to the Node backend. What we should have done was, as soon as we had that team on, I should have paid an extra 20k to have you know a, a DevOps team come in and and uh, figure this out. It would have been more more utilization for for the money, but. It's always easy to be wise in retrospect, but for anyone who is about to embark on this journey, like spend some time thinking about infrastructure first, only to optimize so that you can for switching as soon as possible. That would be my recommendation. Um, yes, we also started by writing the front end app in Clojure Script and keeping the Node.js backend uh, the way it was. Uh, and the idea behind that was that we had a team of JavaScript developers and and like one new closure script guy as we were transitioning. And um, looking back, it would have been better to start with the back end, even though the, 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 the front end was the one that sort of opened the door to closure script for us. Uh, it would have been better to utilize the team uh, that knew how to build you know React apps in JavaScript. Uh, do that and then transition to the back end. But all of this unfolded very gradually for us. So uh, um, again, I'm putting this out there for someone who's who's may potentially walk down the uh, similar path. I'd uh, love to to chat about the various options and how to optimize for team utilization. Because uh, I think uh, even as we did it, it was definitely the right call, but we could have been uh, smarter looking back. Yeah, so the one thing you do to sell it internally is to have people as soon as possible do REPL-driven development in, in, on the JVM. Um, it is a, a fantastic development experience. It drastically reduces the time from like playing around with an idea to actually implementation code. I would almost argue that it's, it almost uh, reduces or removes the distinction between playing around and writing produ production code. The difference is when I ship some code to production, I remove the comment block that shows you exactly how I played around with the code. Um, and um, it's, um, and I even put a point here about saving that cluttered code around uh, because it's a, it's a good sort of introduction to the code for the next person coming. So when you're a junior team and everyone is learning together, it may be helpful to see what sort of, what, 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 what document strings had or what documentation had to be looked up, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, the, the, the feeling of working in the REPL is that code gradually evolves and you just sort of sit there and play around and poke around with it. And um, every time I feel like I stagnated or like I'm not being super productive, it's always because I forgot to run the code or execute the code. I'm like, I'm, I'm either up in my head or I'm like writing uh, a whole bunch of, this is the international sign of programming, but I'm writing a bunch of code. And um, instead of executing it and going gradually, you know? And uh, I think uh, the, the REPL and the approach in, um, in the closure community um, encourages running code a lot and it brings you closer to the code and closer to the problem, closer to the data. It's um, closer, I mean, closer with this. Um, and the feeling of it is that it's a little bit like TDD, but less strict. Um, and it's easy to sort of graduate from playing around in proper, writing proper tests, but um, uh, yeah, moving on. I do want to say something about TDD that I think for the fir first couple of weeks of doing closure, it was super helpful for me. I did it just for my own learning experience. And um, uh, before you figure out what the, the, some of the nuances are, the various collection types and how to convert between them and, and how to, to check for equality and, and all of that. And just to make sure that, that your code is doing what you think it does, you know, it could get bitten by lazy evaluation and, and all of that. So, uh, so 
I, I like that people are not super religious about test-driven development in the in the closure space, and uh, and there may even be a mocking attitude. Like there's definitely a, a type of religiosity in the closure community, and I agree with most of it. But for me, when I switched, uh, doing TDD was super helpful. Uh, closure has an awesome just built-in testing library, and doing REPL-driven test-driven development is just a pleasure. It's awesome. Um, yeah, so uh, that was helpful for me. I'm trying to get my team to do it as well. Uh, oh yeah, so I want to talk a little bit of, of um, like last week on this meetup, there was a bunch of talk about the cognitive load of functional programming uh, and um, that that uh, um, I want to, by doing state management properly and I guess, or not doing state, not having state, and uh, and similar techniques, and I think I want to push a little bit on on, or I want to add to to that topic of of reduced cognitive load because uh, I very very much feel like that's a, an undersold thing. Um, I felt like I calmed down like crazy after a couple of weeks of doing closure, and I just um, it's it's way more fun and less intense and less burdening to code now than it was before. I think traditionally, and I, I think I think closure has the same benefits as any other functional programming language uh, applied properly when it comes to the traditional functional paradigm stuff, and that that is very noticeable on in the long term in the sense that if you do proper state management and you do as pure functions as much as possible and immutable uh, data and all of that, uh, after a while you just don't notice that the decline that like you just can keep going for way longer and and you have to look back and say hey why am not I, why am i not in the tar pit like we still have a steady pace we're still making strides after after a year into a massive stride or a massive sprint and and i think it's because of these these functional paradigms and and in fact we got a we got a testimony from a, from a seasoned uh, sas uh, customer success person that we onboarded and and he said uh, so this is one year into this covid uh, tool sprint if you will and everyone had worked a lot he said despite the various issues encountered over the last few days not once was the software the issue this is extremely rare and i think this may be lost on everyone I'm, i have been involved in many software implementations and rarely if ever have i been a part of a software launch where there were no software bugs scalability issues etc Bottom line, Inoculate, that's a product that has been rock solid. The dev team should be extremely proud of this accomplishment and the credit for a successful launch should be singularly given to them. Uh, after this, we got our first scalability issues, of course, right? Because we, we, we got prideful and, and uh, after this uh, came some challenges. But this was literally one year into like working as fast as we can and still like we could roll out software that, that didn't have any bugs. So that was amazing. And like, it, it's all about the team, right? But also the, the, the right team with the right tools. Uh, continuing on reduced cognitive load, um, I think the language of closure is a very, very good choice from this standpoint. Um, the, I already said it made me calmer. I feel like I know fewer things. Um, I can't remember when I had to learn something new. And I want to say that again to all the JavaScript people out there. I don't remember when I learned something new last time. And closure has this sort of simpleness and kindness to it. And I, it's hard to describe without using emotional words, but it just gets out of your way. And if you choose to, to get its help, there's a lot of, of really neat functions in there. And I think that's because it's well designed and because of the macro system. So anything that could be simplified with the help of a macro usually is. So in the end, even if a macro saves you two function calls, in the end, that's a 50% improvement of the amount of code you have to type. And, um, and that gives me the feeling of the people who have gone before me, Rich Hickey and everyone else who's worked on, on in the space, have, have almost like given me gifts, right? They've, they've been considerate and thoughtful and, and I can step in, sort of walk in their footsteps and, and um, enjoy the benefits of their thought works. Um, so it turns out that that uh, cognitive load was an explicit 
the sign object of the closure. I, I didn't, I, so I discovered it for myself, just that I calmed down a lot and I felt happier and more, you know, more solid, I guess. And uh, and then then as I was looking for a quote the other day, I, I found out I found this in one of his speeches that that um, he really set out to reduce cognitive load, and boy, he succeeded. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is stepping into metaphysical territory. So uh, if this is too weird for y'all, bear with me. It's only like three or four slides, uh, but I think. Uh, uh, I want to point something out about the grammar and syntax of, and and when I say closure, I may as well say lisp, but because uh, this applies to lisp, lisps in general, and I think a lot of these things I'm talking about applies to closure specifically, but in this case, I think it's it applies to to um, lisp in general, and I think programming is about making distinctions uh, about things being different from each other, and and usually. Um, when when things are muddy or not clear, um, when someone's working on a problem and I, I and there seems to be some sort of conceptual confusion, it's usually when when a thing is trying to be many things. Uh, I don't know what the correct anti-pattern name for that is, so I just call it a thing that tries to be many things. If you're on my team, you'll know about that anti-pattern, and um, and that means distinctions need to be made, and and a, a thing should be two or three or five, four things, etc. And um, so the act of making a distinction between one thing and another, or, or sort of splicing a thing up into many things, it's, it's basically what we do. And it should be cognitive and typograph typographically. I don't know if that's a word, and I don't know if it means what I think it means, but to, to type it out, it should be cheap. It should be cheap to make a distinction. That, that's my main point, both in your head and in your fingers and when looking at the screen. And in closure, it's always the same thing. It's always the same expression. It's the... Um, it's the it starts with the left pattern and it ends with the right one, and um, um, and and we call it the form, and that's what we operate with, right? Um, I read a book when I was younger that blew me away called *Loss of Form* by George Spencer Brown. It's way way over my head, and um, I think um, it's it's a super interesting book about basically making distinctions and he builds up an algebra that's that's sort of pre um, pre algebraic algebra if you will it drops from grammar into sort of pure logic if you will and then sort of recreates a new grammar that's simpler and it made a huge impact on me in that i was able it was closer to how, how i was actually thinking like my mind doesn't speak equations to me my mind speaks like distinctions and various paths that i that i choose so um when trying to work out an equation, like I can go this way or I can go that way, or like, hey, this thing actually needs to be a little bit different. So I, I was impressed by how this book tried to articulate some of those things and build an algebra around it. And, uh, and even if the book itself, even if the grammar that's being recreated, he claims that he, he is proving the four color theorem that some of you may be familiar with, which it says that any map uh, with with countries on it can be colored in such a way that no two countries share uh, bordering each other have the same color, uh, and it can be done with four colors. And I honestly forgot that if that's I think that it's proven in a number of ways now, but he claims to have a very elegant proof of it based off of this algebra. Uh, but for me, the main point was that he, he sort of detached from grammar and started started over with something new. And the way he used the way he did that was uh, by drawing circles and saying a circle is a distinction and like the inside of the circle is different from the outside of the circle. And, um, and uh, it made a huge impression on me. And I think, um, so when I came to see, when I came to Lisp and Closure, I was sort of prepared because the, the parentheses, the parents can be seen as a circle without the top and the bottom. Um, this is literally from the Loss of Form book and it could be, I think the the left the rightmost form could be seen as as the dry principle, you know, like if, if there are two distinctions and they they have it marked to be differently, you can just have one of them instead. And and the the left one is a bit different. It says um, if you transition over a distinction two time uh, distinction twice, um, you may as well remove the whole thing because it's worthless. Something like that. I forgot exactly what it was, but if you look at it this way, it kind of makes sense. And it's super close to, I think the right thing um, is a good illustration of how to look at a logic tree or 
or or a data that's being modeled and uh, and the and the leftmost is the corresponding closure code if you will of, of traversing that tree um starting from the inside and out of course but um so i think the, the main point here is uh, loss of form and the right hand side of this uh slide is close to at least how i operate cognitively it's it's a it's an illustration of how i operate cognitively that's closer than usual mathematical algebra and the leftmost is um it's closure code so it, like uh, in some sense at least i have been somewhat prepared uh, for, for closure and lisp and I, I suspect it may be similar for others yeah this was a bit pretentious <laughs> so but i wanted to try that try try the idea out and see if i could articulate it and see if anyone else has anything to say in this matter and maybe give a shout out to the loss of form book it's super interesting i think i'm not sure i'm smart enough to make that judgment but um the um, um let me just get this here we go so the idea here is that the, the this sort of simple primary construct of the language the, the does in the end um, result in a noticeable decrease in cognitive load because you're doing the same thing all over and um and if code, coding is about making distinctions, it's very hard to beat the representation or parentheses to uh, distinguish something from that which is around it. So um, I, I think this, this may be a little bit of a, um, a strange point for some of y'all, but uh, I, to me, it seems relevant and I, uh, I think it matters. And I think it implies a deep level of consistency. And I think it comes out as, um, um, a positive cognitive thing. I think others have had a similar experience. And um, this is from the also famous XKCD. And it's just one one uh, out of you know a sequence of comics, but uh, or squares. But um, uh, for a long time when stepping into closure, I walked around and, and almost felt like I was going insane and thinking that oh it's all about the parentheses you know you can just use it to represent everything and yada yada and uh, in order to validate that i'm not insane I've, I've found some help in seeing that other people have had some similar experiences um recommended reading for it like just google xkcd and and this if you want to see some more of it um <laughs> okay this was late last night guys so it's the the famous sage confucius Ridbari, who says when I see parents, I see not something else. And I think that the point here is uh, the, the parenthesis is such a minimalistic expression of a distinction. And that when people complain about the massive amounts of right parents uh, after an expression, I'm like, yeah, but the, the option is you put a bunch of other syntax garbage in between those parents and then you're happy, right? Uh, so um, yeah, that was embarrassing. Um, when the language is super simple, like like uh, like it is uh, some um, the data structures can also be upgraded to grammar and what I'm talking about the literal notations of, of vectors and maps and it makes it pop out and it makes it into um, a very elegant and like Ria actually shared earlier it's very neat like it makes it very neat the whole package of like data being super clear code being super clear and it, it has very very little sort of gibberish around it. And I think the, um, the, the main point of, like the, of intersection between code and data, you'll hear everyone talk about code being data and data being code and all of that. I'm not sure what the meaning of that is, but, uh, but I know that the keyword uh, is somewhere in the middle and, and um, it, it makes for very, very elegant code in transitioning between uh, data and code. Um, moving on. I saw, um, I already told you that the, the cost of opinions grew uh, intensely as, so yeah, I guess we're out of the metaphysical strange portion of this, trying to comment on the grammar, uh, bring it back to earth a little bit. Uh, but uh, the cost of opinions were growing, like grew higher quite significantly. And, and I already mentioned that the closure comes pre-packaged with it. It has immutable data structures. Uh, it ha has a bunch of ideas of how to do state with atoms and refs and all of that. And um, um, and it's basically a bunch of decisions that I don't have to make myself. 
and that was very very helpful uh, okay that got messed up yeah so i just in, i had a and we had an intern just a couple of weeks ago and i told him to go learn closure and come back to me and um uh, and he did come back to me after I hardly heard anything for two weeks and then come back and asked him how, how it was going. And he said, well, it makes it really hard to change things. And I literally hired him on the spot. I'm like, bingo, that, that's the whole point. Um, hi, Jonathan. Good job, man. Um, I guess he's no longer an intern, so I just changed the title. I got a one through the journey of switching, I got one angry email from one of my favorite people who said, who was not a fan of this. And, uh, and I wanted to mention that too, because that, that did happen. It was not all sunshine and love, you know? And he, there was a quite an intense email rant, you know, and, and uh, we talked it out, um, but basically this is the criticism that he put forth. And, uh, and I asked him before if I was able to, to share some of this. And, uh, and uh, I, I wouldn't say anything I won't say to his face. So, uh, but I want to, so I want to share this though, that um, uh, he made some points about popularity and that it being a dead language. And mo what I want to highlight is that it's stagnated and there's no language updates. And I already mentioned that that's a feature. And um, the popularity part could be argued, could not be argued. Like it's, uh, it may be a point, it may, um, um, I don't want to use any tools that, that are used only because of their popularity, which he also says, we talked about that. I want to use the right tool, the right thing, you know. Um, deployment had some criticism about the JVM not being super adopted on the cloud, which is also correct. Um, I know the Closure team has worked on that extensively though. Um, there's there's a very, very small talent pool and, and new bag who bought Cognitech are sucking up all the talent. Uh, I, I, I think the talent pool size was overplayed as a as a problem. Um, now we're, we've grown a lot, and we can be a little bit more systematic about recruitment, and we're also more um, uh, we have, have less issues training our closure people ourselves because it's it, the language gets out of out of your way very fast, and um, and I think even, even if new banks accept all the talent that there is in North America. It's still good for the language in the long run, and we can train more people. And I think I think I think it's all good as long as the popularity of the language grows. There was some some criticism about JS being good, JS being good enough or better, um, and I think that was uh, I think we simply disagree there in many ways. And then there were some comments on tooling and libraries. Uh, the libraries in the closure space are are a little bit more raw and less polished than in the JavaScript scene because of just the sheer amount of people working on them. And it feels more like it's an offering of a set of tools rather than prepackaged libraries that you interact with. So I think it's almost more a philosophical uh, thing than um, than anything else. So I asked them before this call, uh, the current incarnation of the team, um, about the pros and cons of, of Clojure. And the pros are almost exclusively REPL-driven development and various articulations of the syntax being nice to work with. So concise code, clarity, and syntax, uh, but REPL driven development is what everyone answers. Uh, the old grumpy farts in Knivsta says that we should do strong typing, <laughs> but uh, sorry, that's my, my um, uh, home place in Sweden. Um, we should do strong typing, and I, I get it, you have a point, it would be nice, it's the same feedback on every closure project. I'm not sure it would be closure if it had strong typing, but that would be, I think that's on the negative side. Uh, I. I may or may not agree. There may or may not be other ways of handling that, but I, I understand that it's a point, and especially in a junior heavy team, strong typing and the tools around it could be helpful. I I agree. Uh, and there's also a perceived lack of communicate or documentation, and this idea of like libraries being not super polished. Uh, all of that is true, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, still worth it in my book. Uh, you may or may not agree. There's a distinct attitude of let's get it done in the community. And, uh, and I think that's in part why there's like less shiny libraries uh, because no one is if, sort of focused on uh, maintaining a, a small library. They maintain them well, but there's, there's small teams and everyone's busy. And I think um, there's a lot of good closure code out there that's not really wrapped up in a library yet because 
people move on to other things. I saw a lot of people disappear into the jungle of like convention over configuration in the Ruby on Rails days. I don't know if anyone remember that, but uh, basically it, it sort of, in my opinion, it changed a bunch of programmers from being able to write decent code to sitting there and Googling what the Rails way of writing the appropriate code would be. So it sort of, um, it, it took good programmers and, and made them insecure about what the best way of doing something that they knew how, uh, already knew how to solve would be. And I, I, I dare say that because I was a part of that. And like, I, I, I sat there and was wondering about the most idiomatic Ruby co code for everything. And then I worked with a guy at the time who was, he was new in my project. It was a, a pretty big Rails app. And he didn't give an F about the, like idiomatic Ruby code. He sat there and basically typed out C code in, in you know, the Ruby on Rails controller. And uh, it just popped the bubble. And I, and I, 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 I accomplished uh, Zen of programming after that. I got free from all the ideas about what the perfect code should be. Uh, thank you, Peter. And um, the so the, there's a temptation of, of spending time researching what the idiomatic closure way of doing it is, but the idiomatic closure way of doing it is getting it done. Uh, there's so many ways of solving each problem that that you should just get it done. And the idea there I'm trying to express is: Do you want to build build stuff, or do you want to Google how to build stuff? And, and uh, with Clojure being such a powerful tool, there's always the just build and move on sort of option. Uh, I wanted to highlight a little bit more. I don't know, am I short on time? Like, I don't know how long I've been going. I guess we can move on a bit longer. Uh, I want to highlight the joy aspect of programming. And uh, I've, I, I've been doing this for a long time now. I realized, okay, I'm getting old guys. I realized that 25 years is not enough. I've been doing this for 30 years, I guess. I'm on my 40th year now, as my wife points out. Uh, and I'm excited as pro I'm as excited uh, regarding programming as I've ever been. Like all traces of cynicism and, and tiredness is gone for me. And um, I no longer have the sense of, of like constantly having to patch a burning house. Uh, the, I think the long-term stability comes from the functional aspects of this. And, uh, and the daily joy and excitement comes from, from the REPL and from playing around with the expressiveness of closure. And, and uh, I frequently get these like small bouts of joy when I code. And when I, like, I literally rejoice when I see how short and concise some of the standard, standard library functions are and how well they play together. And I just feel gratitude to the people who, who've done this work. So I wanted to bring it. Marcus, <clears throat> I just want to say yeah. you have 20 more minutes. 20 more minutes. Yeah. I got it. I, th I think I can do it. Thank you. Uh, feel free to ping me again when it's five minutes left or something. Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so we're doing, um, looking at some code and this is a, a, along the aspect or the topic of joy and expressiveness. So one thing that I, I very much like and I rejoice in daily is that keywords are functions and, fu and maps are functions too. So if you see, and th this is a map, the map literal, and it's called X. It has two keys in it, some and another, and they both map to, to a string. And uh, there's a test here, checking for equality, just to prove that this is the same thing. And the, the first, uh, uh, the sum X ret retrieves the value of the key sum in the map of X. So, so the keyword is a function. So th this is for those who haven't seen this before. The first argument in a, in a list that starts with parentheses is the, a function call. So you see it clearly on the get. So that means call the function get. Um, and um, so this is called the function uh, of the keyword called sum on the map of x. And then the the map being a data type is also a function. So if you call it, that also calls the get function with the key sum. And both of them obviously are the same as calling get from the map X with the keyword sum. And all of these three things are uh, equivalent. They do the same thing, uh, but it gives me options of how to express myself in code. And um, I'm tr trying to, in a somewhat contrived manner, illustrate why that matters. Um, it's uh, some code to find my Lamborghini car and um, I don't have a Lamborghini. This was a made up thing, unfortunately. But it, it does change the semantics a little bit. Like expired my car registration date, expired registration date my car, and expired get my car registration date. Like some of these are easier to read than others. 
I think I vote for number two, and most of my code is based off of number two. Uh, but I acknowledge that there may be other options, uh, there may be other opinions. But in this particular case, like it, it matters slightly, or it changes slightly how easy the code is to read. Uh, what is it that's expired? As soon as possible after expired, I want to see the, the thing that's expired, and that's a registration date. So um, I just love seeing that, or that that I, I love that I have options for that. The other thing is, uh, so now you see the keywords here have slashes in them. That means that they're namespaced. So uh, I can have a page event ID in one namespace, and it doesn't conflict with an event ID of another namespace. So if I need to merge a couple of maps, it won't be any conflicts. And in this case. Um, I immediately see. Oh, sorry. I immediately see that this um, this code has to do with some database tables, and um, it's super clear to me what it does. And the fact that it's it's um, uh, camel cased or it's a snake cased and not kebab cased means it's coming from the database. That's not conventional in the closure space. Most people kebab case everything coming out of the database, but to me, it signals things. So I very quickly know where the data is from. Uh, also, I know on the in the previous uh, meetup, uh, someone was asking about the about the presenter's favorite function, and here's Juxt, and I happen to agree it's one of my absolute favorites as well. It calls the functions after uh, one at a time on the argument, and so we could unpack this a little bit. Uh, but but basically, if you have a database row, it will call these functions one at a time. And these the, the keywords representing the data are also functions that's called uh, according to the previous slide that you see so 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 i don't know i just get really happy seeing this type of this kind of code um then we have some other ideas of the expressive freedom all of these things do the same thing um if you're interested we can unpack that too but i'm, I'm going to move on for now um Another junior on my team said that uh, closure is pretty concise on each line. You can easily tell what each line is doing because of keywords and abstraction. Um, hi, Matthew. Uh, that was uh, that was in when I asked him uh, what he liked about closure, and and he come like he made a PR like day two or something with a, with a good change in it because it, it sort of gets out of the way. Like it's very easy to to see what each row does, and I appreciate him trying to articulate that. Yeah. So the macro question. Um, we there's a there's some basically the teaching in the eco ecosystem is don't do macros like you probably don't need to do them and and that's been true so far for us but I think the macros should still be appreciated uh, in that they improve the standard library so I just wanted to comment a bit on that um, this is a macro the thread macro that we've seen before the uh, that I think is a very good tool to reduce cognitive load if you see the distance between the parameter a that's being passed as the last argument to the function map um, thread last macro here makes us pass that sort of from the top instead and adds it onto at the bottom here and you can see that there's like the, you know, a concrete distance reduction and i think that's that is concretely less things for your brain to have to keep track of the distance between uh, the 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 various the, the two instances of a is smaller to the right and not only like in, in graphical coordinates, but also in that it has twice as many, if not more, of statements in between or expressions. And I think if if you're able to move, maneuver around like that, uh, in the end, in the code base, in your code base, it's going to be a drastic reduction in how easy it is for your brain to parse code. I don't know if that made any sense, but uh, I was excited about it. And then all, you can even improve, improve it even more by using a partial and and some experienced um, closure developers may say that I should be doing a transducer instead. I still don't understand how to use them correctly. I hope to graduate to that one day. Um, one, one thing that we've noticed is a dra drastic reduction of wheat fill, which is a highly technical Swedish term that I teach everyone on my team. It is uh, literally, it means something like bullshit error, I think is the closest um, uh, translation I've seen. It's defined as something that makes you question logic itself and all existing order of the universe, but when it is resolved, it was 100% completely uninteresting, but restores the order of the universe and logic itself. So I've noticed that that stuff has just disappeared. That like spending two hours trying to figure out why something is broken, is just gone. Like we don't do that anymore. Um, 
uh, yeah, so um, missing clutter. I, I spend after having you know done the switch to closure, I spent a long time looking at an SQL statement and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. And it, it wouldn't compile or it wouldn't, uh, Postgres didn't accept it. It turned out that I'd forgotten the, the commas in between the values I was inserting and I just couldn't see it. And it made me question what the value of those commas were. And if you don't know, the, the closure is very, very concise. Like you don't have to use commas if you don't want to and a bunch of other things you don't have to like, uh, use. So um, uh, commas for me then goes into the category of cruft, which according to hacker jargon file is the dust that the digital equivalence of dust that gathers under your bed and the result of a shoddy construction or a super superfluous junk. And so um, I, I could interpret that as things that my brain has to parse that doesn't help my mission. So apparently commas is one of those things. And so I made a craft, craftometer, which is basically plotting or counting the amount of craft in our big rewrite in Closure and Closure script and our original code base in JavaScript. And so the yellow, the bright orange, I could have choose the colors better, I guess. The bright orange uh, yellowy thingy is from JavaScript and the dark orange is from Closure. And so you see uh, that there's a drastic, like there's at least 24,000 something commas that I don't have to read when I read the code. And there's a bunch of, uh, a lot less of uh, quotes and, and semicolons and all of that. Yeah, so, so what I see when I see, what I think when I see this graph is things my brain does not have to wrestle with in order to understand the code. Uh, similarly, the comparison, I know this is apples to oranges. This is just lines of code from the same projects, the, uh, the first JavaScript implementation. I, I would say, so um, there's all, you could always argue that it's easier to rewrite something and that you can make it more efficient. Uh, but I also think that the closure rewrite of this is actually a little bit ahead in features. So we've heard it before, like from the quote in the beginning of the talk, that it should be a factor of five difference. And that's true for us too. The, it's f the uh, amount of code lines is a factor of 5.35 difference. And that's also way less things for me to read, right? The word uh, count is similar, 5.82 in difference. Uh, this is an interesting, this is counting the amount of calls to func how many, how many times a function in our closure code base was called and uh, just sorting it by, by amount of calls. And you see some function here called 900 times in one of the code bases and then drastic drops. Um, the re reason I wanted to highlight that was I have a thesis that I think the, the, you could prove that the standard library is efficient by, by seeing a lot of standard library functions here. And what I want to go towards is figuring out what is the most efficient way of learning closure. And if you want to work on my team, these are the top 10 or top something something of each project. Uh, the interesting part here is that the, the middle column is actually the, is a front end project. So it has a, it relies a lot on anonymous functions, probably to handle events and effects. So it has a, a FN, which declares a function at the top. And the other one has defn, which is which um, is um, declares a named function. So this would be an anonymous function. This is a macro that turns into a def and a fn. So and this this piece here is my answer to what is the 2080 rule of closure in if you want to work with us. 2080 being the idea that there's usually a way to get to do 20% of the work and get 20 80% of the results. So this. This represents 80% of all function calls in our, our three uh, distinct closure code bases. And uh, I, now I'm going to do a speed run of all of these to explain them each a singular one. Uh, that was a joke. I'm not going to do that. That's another talk. Uh, there was one here that stood out for me that I didn't know uh, when I put this together, which was F Neil. It's right here. So I highlighted that because I wanted to know what it did. And it perfectly illustrates the joy of working with closure. So F nil, this is typically what you would see when I'm poking around in code. You see a comment block, and then you see a bunch of things playing around with something. So closure REPL doc F nil explains what it does. I should probably have actually included the, the, the documentation here. But um, it, it, uh, it, uh, it returns the function that's, that's called 
if it if it returns a function that can handle the nil case as an argument. So if you have a function that that says hello or formats a string based on the argument, and uh, you do an f nil of that function, with it, it gives it a default argument that's called when the, the argument is nil. So hello baby Yoda uh, returns hello baby Yoda. Hello nil returns hello null. Hello two, which is the f nil version of the function, with nil returns hello what's up because I give it um, um, a default argument. And um, I would previously have implemented this, this with an or, as you can see here, but now I learned something new because this case was way cleaner. So that's fnil for you. And that's just a typical example of the, the joy that's in the closure code base. You can find stuff like this. Okay, thanks, bye. No, um, yeah, so we intend to keep growing. We are working on ridiculously exciting problems. Um, and we're, uh, uh, if you want to work with us and you're a good closure developer, please reach out. We are looking for a, like a high profile recruitment in the form of an engineering manager that will work between me and the dev team to keep everyone happy. Uh, so shameless plug, if you, if you know someone who we should talk to, or if you're that person, uh, please reach out. And that's it. I think I made it within 20 minutes, did I? Yes, you did. Thank you very much. Awesome. You did it in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome thank you, you yeah speed it up. A, a bit fast maybe yeah yeah thank you very much for your very nice presentation of course i have some some um, questions uh what would be the key things switching to closure i mean you made a long pre said long presentation but you made a presentation <laughs> yeah. what's like the key takeaways here i think the key takeaway is that it that it's possible that it's that's easier when than you think it is and it's worth it every step of the way that you can do mm. So uh, that would be the key takeaways. Yeah. Probably, probably play around with closure in, uh, for two weeks yourself, and then sh push it to the team uh, because it's so fun. I also think uh, that most developers are addicted to novelty. So when you present them with something exotic, they they get like, oh, hey, what's this? You know, every project, everyone always wants to use a new database. You know, so you can sort of sell it into their dopamine <laughs> circuitry <laughs> if if you intend to. Yeah. Yep. Yes. How come you ended up in Houston? Was it the weather? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I tell everyone here that it's it's uh, uh, the opposite of what it's like in in Sweden. It's uh, it's it's everyone stays in in the summertime because it's so hot outside. Oh. So I think. I, but but the difference is that it's bright. So in Sweden, everyone stays in in the winter time, but it's dark. Yes. And uh, so it's slightly less depressive here. But um, uh, no, it's because of the medical center. So my co-founder is a doctor. Uh, we're in the medical field, and, and Houston has uh, one of the largest medical centers in the world called the Texas Medical Center. It's literally um, a, a part of a city that's made up of hospitals and hospitals only. And um, so uh, he ended up here. Uh, he married a Swedish lady that came to our wedding, and um, uh, I was looking for the next thing to do, and, and uh, our wives are friends. Yeah. So it's a story there. Yeah, maybe for the next time. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Didn't know that. Um, you talked also a little bit, and this is also my experience. That once you grow a team enough, you can start like onboarding people with zero experience in the programming language that you work with. I previously worked with Erlang, and then we yeah. onboarded people from, in the beginning it was tough to find people, but as soon as yeah. you come over a certain size, it's like, ah, whatever, we just find good people, and if they're willing, we'll, we'll teach them. Exactly, that's no, that's my experience. Also. Uh, absolutely, and I think it also has to do with our confidence in the language and the tooling and all of that. And I think we we started doing that pretty early. But I think um, looking back, I think the 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 thing that's the pain the the thing that that could use some more work in that area is like tooling and the flow of development. And I I, I think we're still a little bit behind there. Yeah. So the language the language itself is super easy to pick up and it's easy to communicate. Uh, but I, but I know, like sometimes I discover that someone is like actively, you know, restarting the JVM every time, and I'm like, "What are you doing? You're missing the whole point." And like, "What? What are you talking about?" And so, the communication of tooling and I guess mentorship is, mm -hmm. um, it, it comes with a cost, basically onboarding new people. But um, it's possible. That that's that's my sort of uh, that, that's the hope I could communicate. It's possible. It's easier than what I thought it was, and it's still there's some work to be done there. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Another thing, how much math do you know? Do you need to know math to start enclosure? 
<laughs> no, I don't, yeah. So it so may actually be hurtful. To, <laughs> it, it it may be it may be it may be um, a bad thing to know math because of the prefix notation. Oh, okay. So so the first time you write an expression, you you start with the operator. So uh, two plus two enclosure is uh, parenthesis plus two two. And it will take you around 38 days to figure out what you're doing wrong because you're so used to doing the other way around. And uh, and then after you realize how easy it is to always have the same order of things. But short answer is no. Yeah, I don't need any yeah. math, I think. <laughs> yeah. Let me see. Uh, a lot of people thanking you for your nice, nice talk here in the chat. Uh, oh, awesome. One... Thank you. Yes. You're w very welcome. I uh, have another uh like question thought like raw tools instead of framework is like is a feature instead of using frameworks you put your own raw tools together to to become I, i've actually yeah. seen this I, I, I when i started out my junior career i was like oh let's go frameworks and after a while like throw away the frameworks <laughs> use separate libraries or tools instead it, it, exactly you know i 100 agree and and uh it that's probably the largest culture shock coming coming from like for modern like code school JavaScript people who are like used to downloading an NPM package and 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 it's like no one does that in the closure space and no one really cares and it's like it's uh, I used to yeah the I used to I it was a big freedom and a big step for me to realize that I'm on the library side of libraries versus like versus frameworks but I think closure is is a third option it's like it's not even libraries it's like just get the job done and. And, you know, because the standard library would be like the, the library, so mm -hmm. most of it happens there. Yeah, I guess I talked about that in the beginning, but 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 yeah, I, I agree very much. Yeah, then we got one more comment here, like from Oscar. Lisp seems like they need fewer languages iterations. I agree. Yeah, I mean, it's because it, it it said that it was so simple that it was discovered rather than invented. <laughs> okay. It's on a different level. <laughs> It's on a different level, guys. Like I, yeah. I don't know what to say. Like it's, it's. Um, I, I'm, I'm. I have religious feelings about it. Like it's, it's blowing my mind. And I, I see people all around me who has had the same experience, because of the simplicity. I'm so sick of learning new things. I'm so sick of complicated things. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's. Uh, it just resonates with me. And I'm not saying that's for everyone, and that's okay. But, but, uh, but I agree. And I, th I think the, the, the slightly less emotional answer is yeah, it's because of the macro system <laughs> probably. Like if you need a language feature, it's like yeah, build it, you know. Yeah, I'm gonna see if there's more questions here. Uh, not more questions, but thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, your yeah, presentation, absolutely, Marcus. Thank you. It was really nice and really nice that you can join us from Houston also. Absolutely, anytime. And like I've come up with at least two or three different topics after this. Oh, and, um, cool. uh, I'm super grateful that you guys put this, you know, together. And and I think. Um, uh, more people talking about functional programming. I was a little bit disappointed that it wasn't about uh, funk and progressive music because I'm a bass player too. But functional programming would be the thing that could trump those things. So. <laughs> maybe funk from Sweden. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. And with that said, um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining in. Uh, in October 26, we're back with the ninth uh, meetup this year. Uh, and then we'll have a presentation in OCaml and then a presentation around Erlang. Check it out, I've already published it on the meetup page. And then we'll run one more in November and then one more in December. Uh, so if you have anything you want to present or you know someone that can or should present, get them in touch with me and uh, we'll put them on. And uh, as I said to Marcus before we started this, it's like this is a meetup. So even if you never presented before, you're welcome. That's the idea. It's a meetup. Come on and present your things. With that said, thank you everyone for watching. And please remember to subscribe in YouTube and to join our meetup on the meetup community group. Thank you very much and thanks for tonight. Goodbye everyone.